Welcome to Lifestyle by Design, helping you solve everyday challenges. I'm Karen Jacobs, an occupational therapist, a Brookline Rotarian, and a professor at Boston University. And here's my co-host. Hi. Thank you. And I'm Andrea Calso. Today we have a wonderful episode prepared for all of you. We are joined by two wonderful occupational therapists, Nicole Picone and Tamara Bar Barbosa. And they've joined us here today to talk about emergency planning and disaster preparedness, or disaster planning emergency preparedness. I think that covers pretty much all the bases. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they both bring some really wonderful expertise to, to the field. And it's actually very timely for two it reasons. Is. One, we just had a massive stone <laughs> snowstorm in Boston <laughs> that we're all still recovering from. That's right. And two, it's Occupational Therapy Month, but even more importantly, in the United States, occupational therapy is 100 years old. So congratulations for being part of this great profession. And we're very excited about what you're doing because it is unique. And you mm -hmm. are the, you know, paving the way for many other people to get involved in this area. So let's just get started. OK. Sure. Nicole, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, and I know you have um, some materials to kind of get us oriented with what we're talking about and kind of what makes this discussion a little bit unique. Yes. Um, so I've been living in the area for about 11 years now, and I've been licensed as an occupational therapist for about three. Um, and currently I uh, am wrapping up my first year working for a nonprofit called Youth Villages, uh, but more of in the consultant role. So I get to work with specialists. Um, very closely that provide intensive in-home family services for at-risk youth um, ages 5 to 18 with, um, who are wrestling with some serious emotional and behavioral challenges, wow. which is work I'm pretty excited about. Yeah. But um, the work I'm going to talk about today is more related to my doctoral research at Tufts University last year. Um, yeah, I, uh, I was originally interested in humanitarian work and potentially working for NGOs abroad. And when I was in graduate school, I got more interested in uh, the vulnerable populations that existed in the United States. So I got really curious about exploring the question of uh, what were OT practitioner perceptions about disaster preparedness or emergency planning, and uh, really like what is the best way to go about educating them. Mm -hmm. um, so I got more involved in the design of an educational workshop uh, targeting OTs interested in learning more about the subject and kind of provided an introduction to emergency management as best I could understand it. And um, I had a lot of fun doing it and it really um, struck a nerve with a lot of people I think who were very interested in getting more involved. That's great. Can, yeah, can I just ask, you mentioned vulnerable populations. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe describe some of those that you were thinking about um, mm -hmm. in doing this? Um, traditionally I think what often comes to mind for people is um, children, older adults, um, people with medical conditions, but um, the term access and functional needs has been adopted at federal and state levels. And uh, I think it blends really beautifully with what the op populations OT serve. Um, and this could include a whole wide range of uh, folks with mobility limitations, um, psychiatric conditions, um, people who rely on certain assistive technologies for communication um, and so forth. So it encompasses a much wider range in terms of how people function in daily life and what they need to really thrive. Yeah. That's great. It was, was there anything that sparked that interest when you started your doctoral program? Um, I think it stemmed probably from an interest in a basically assessing whether people were prepared for emergencies, um, whether in their daily life or for more um, large-scale disasters. And it had occurred to me that um, because of the many conveniences we have in modern culture, it seemed uh, a lot of people actually weren't that familiar with local resources or what to do if the power cut out or the cell phone towers weren't functioning. And it really prompted a lot of questions about the role that OTs could play um, personally and professionally in preparing families that they worked with in whatever respective settings they worked in. Great. 
Tamara, I just want to mention is just got accepted to yes. an occupational <laughs> therapy program, yeah. um, Boston University. We've talked about Tufts. We'll say yes. BU also yeah. <laughs> um, as well. So we're very happy to be welcoming very you to excited. the profession. Thank you so, so much. So how did you get involved in this? In emergency preparedness? Mm -hmm. um, so I had always wanted to work with um, people with maybe some limitations or special needs. Um, so I did a lot of volunteer work, and during that time I found that I wanted to do occupational therapy. Um, I didn't get into it right away. Instead, I looked at other programs and I found um, a healthcare emergency management program at BU as well. And this really sparked my interest because I wanted to see how these populations could be served during an emergency. So I studied that and I just finished in September. And um, I currently work at a hospital now um, helping out with uh, safety operations um, and emergency preparedness. Uh, so I'm really excited about being in the healthcare setting, but now I'm excited even more to apply it through occupational therapy. And it sounds like my eventually doctoral part of my program might yeah. be very much in line with what you did. Yeah, which is so, exciting. Um, and it exciting. Seems, sounds like you're interested in like targeting more of a population too. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Do you have so, one population you're thinking about? Um, not necessarily. I have had a lot of experience um, in volunteer work with children with autism, um, and that was something that really sparked my interest because it's a challenging field, and each um, kind of child is very unique and has unique needs. Mm -hmm. And so I really appreciated that aspect, and the role in emergency preparedness is very crucial because, like we'll show you eventually, the kits can be very specific and specialized to each individual, regardless if they have special needs or not. Maybe I have a favorite toy or something that I want to bring or <laughs> et cetera, Great. snack maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so. so Nicole, I know you brought some materials to um, kind of help us sort of wrap our heads around mm -hmm. you know, what we're talking here when we talk about um, a disaster planning, emergency preparedness. So mm -hmm. I, w I was hoping you could kind of talk us through that. Sure, yeah. Um, so one, the first one initially, uh, I had kind of fleshed out <coughs> key players that were involved in emergency management between public safety, law enforcement, um, public health, and then healthcare facilities. And I was really interested in how they blended with um, the values that we hold and the principles um, within our own OT practice framework. And really kind of examining um, those links between the OTs working in um, a number of healthcare facilities, um, whether it's um, outpatient or long-term care, but also really considering um, what FEMA now refers to as their whole community approach. Uh, considering the OTs who work in schools or in community-based practice and really how to start integrating them in um, into the emergency plans that towns are starting to create. Mm -hmm. um, and I really loved the concept that emergency planning is really directly connected to health promotion. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I'd actually heard noted by um, Dr. Atia Martin, who now serves, I believe, as the Chief Resilience Officer in Boston. Um, there's a lot of great research and work being done out there to blend these different models. Great. Yeah. And then I had created this kind of visual breakdown of um, the three steps, kind of the generic steps I thought <coughs> were most important for everyone to consider um, when you think about sheltering in place or evacuating. And what it really came down to was making a plan, uh, making a kit, and doing the drill. So plan, pack, practice. And I had introduced OTs in the workshop to um, the family emergency communication plan that FEMA's posted on their site. I just think it's a wonderful example and a great template to start from. Um, and really fleshing out the details of what that looks like. And then moving forward to um, developing their own emergency kit and actually doing the drill. Uh, this was a table I'd created that a lot of people found was convenient. Um, it might be a little bit difficult to read with the small print, but uh, it was a breakdown of different ways that OTs could start volunteering or register with certain organizations to get more training. And um, I kind of broke it down uh, by four different groups, and I had highlighted the Medical Reserve Corps in particular just because of the nature of what they were offering, um, and as well as sort of mandated hours and time commitments, and ultimately just providing a bit more detail so OTs um, or anyone could surf through at their own will mm -hmm. and um, can always look up um, the respective websites. So this all led to um, me facilitating three separate workshops with a total of 25 participants last year, which was really great fun. And um, 
It was a mixture of PowerPoint lectures and tabletop exercises. And at the end, I provided a post survey, which included this question, should the OT profession have basic competency standards in this subject area? And um, while 22 out of the 25 indicated yes, I will always know, of course, they're biased. They came to the workshop as volunteers. <laughs> but um, really, it stimulated a greater conversation uh, among people about what they could do and what should be the expectation for professionals in this field. And it's not something that is well fleshed out. Um, I know that a lot of um, folks in between uh, the physician and nursing professions have really, in the past 10 years, made attempts to define official competency standards. And uh, there was a lot of feedback from people about what that might entail for OTs. So. Very interesting. And I think what's also interesting about something you mentioned a little bit earlier is the fact that, I mean, you really could find an, an occupational therapist anywhere. And I think that's something that we've mentioned yeah. before on this show about how applicable the profession is. And, and really, it lends itself to the theme of the show, which is helping you solve everyday challenges. And so yeah. mm -hmm. to me, after listening to this, it, it makes sense that it, it's a role that an occupa uh, occupational therapist could hold is thinking about what those challenges might be. And an emergency is a challenge. And that's something it really mm -hmm. could happen mm -hmm. at any moment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we just had this <laughs> massive snowstorm, not as massive as, of, as maybe previous years. But um, it certainly, mm -hmm. people were homebound. Maybe they lost power during that time. They didn't have access to the outside world. So yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and thinking about all, all of that, I know that you both um, brought some emergency kits yes. and um, <laughs> maybe you can walk us through what's in those and, and so that we as individuals can think about, you know, if we had to plan for an emergency, what should we be thinking about? What do we need? What um, kinds of supplies would we want? What kind of information do we need to have assembled? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be great. Please sure. yeah. start. We've got so, a few things here. Can we start with what's on the table? Sure. Yeah, go for it. So This is a lantern. Uh -huh. um, so what you always want to do is have some sort of device that you could have light because, like you said, there could be a power outage during yes. a winter storm or any other natural event. Um, so what this provides is actually it has a little... Um, compass on top as well is light and this is also a nice device it's a multifunctional device it has a radio and it also has a siren and a flashlight oh wow great and it's pretty lightweight um, so if you do have a kid at home make sure that your batteries are separated so yes. so the battery, <laughs> yeah. batteries are really key right. and making sure that they're always working right yes. <laughs> that's an important one <laughs> Yeah. You have a few more things on here. I Should we do. go with that first and then we'll go sure. dig into the backpacks? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I brought a co couple items that people probably wouldn't normally think of. And these are more geared towards pe the pediatric side. But um, these were just some liquid chalk markers. You can actually write directly on windows with these. And um, it's been a really wonderful tool for children who, um, anywhere from children who may need a distraction, have a lot of extra energy. Um, it's a great way to focus um, if you're in an environment that may or may not be chaotic um, or may or may not be unstable in different ways. Just a, an example of a tool that um, parents and caregivers can use to really um, promote kind of like an active structured activity. That's cool. It sounds like these could write on many surfaces, yeah. Yeah. glass yes. mirrors, plastics, whiteboards, windows. So for windows. even emergency, right? To write right. Something yeah. <laughs> yes. An There's a yeah. double function there. So if yeah. you ever need it. <laughs> no, it's great. Actually, I, I would think this would be good to have in a car. Yeah. Actually, yeah. That's true. And at any point in time. Yeah, that is right. a good idea. Along right. with duct tape. And I'm thinking right. if you have at yes. least one thing, you don't even need to worry about paper. You, no, right. <laughs> you've yeah. got any other surface no, in your house. No, that's great. No, that's yeah. really I love that you clever. brought up the car idea. Sorry to interject yeah, a little bit. Um, a lot of people don't think about where they are during emergency. Yes. Yeah. So it's really um, essential to have a kit wherever you spend most of your time, whether so, that's driving yeah. to and from work. So it's always beneficial to have a a little, at least a mini kit in your car. Right. So, so a blanket in the car. Yep. Mm -hmm. A snack. Um, water. Water. Yep. Contact um, information. Even cash, if you may not have access to an ATM. Mm -hmm. I know in this day and age, a lot of people don't carry right. cash on them. Correct. Um, even uh, writing down the phone numbers of family and friends, if you lose access to your cell phone or even your cell phone charger, mm -hmm. that was another one. Mm -hmm. And yeah. one thing that you've shared with me before is, um, I think, prescriptions? Yep, I actually have a little checklist. Oh, is that yeah, okay? let's do that. Oh, yeah. All right, so here's um, a little emergency kit checklist. It's a pretty basic um, 
checklist, I can kind of read off a few things. So this is something that you might want to have at home. So like three days of non-perishable food. So that would be if you had to shelter in place and you couldn't leave your house for whatever reason. And that includes water as well. So the essential part of the food is the hydration. You could actually um, dehydrate pretty easily um, and you need to have one gallon per day per person. So wow. if you have a household mm. of four people, you need one gallon per day per person. So do the math, that's quite a lot of water. It is. Um, so it's very important to be mindful of, of how quickly we dehydrate as human beings. Um, mm -hmm. So the other thing is, um, like we said, flashlight, a battery operated radio, you had mentioned cash, a first aid kit is very important, and also a, a charger. So they have wind up chargers, they have all these great mm -hmm. technologies that don't require electricity to, to charge mm -hmm. things. Um, and also identification cards, medications, your doctor's information, and um, OT's favorite things, um, toothpaste, mm -hmm. and all of the essentials oh, yes. to get through <laughs> your bathroom needs. <laughs> and also um, clothes, and if you have pets, that's also very important, they're part of our families. Mm -hmm. So you wanna make sure you have enough supplies for them. Um, and I love the idea of toys and other activities. And in terms of vital records, um, this is very important as well. Um, they've suggested in the past that you put it all on a USB drive and it's mm -hmm. encrypted. Because oh. what happens is if you, if you have your documentation and you lose it for whatever reason, that's very important information. And the information that you would want to keep are things like a birth certificate, maybe family photos. That way you can identify people if you've been se separated mm -hmm. from your family. Um, your marriage certificate, your insurance card, your social security card, and maybe some other guardianship uh, information that you have. So would you um, add to that maybe uh, your passport, like a photocopy of your Definitely. passport as well, yep. I would think would be good to add to that. Definitely, if you have to leave. Yeah. Yeah. Another form of identification, definitely. Yes. Yes. Yep. So you've got more things in backpacks and <laughs> yes, we do. Um, I see stickers, too. Yeah, I tucked those away um, partially because these are just fun to have if you have young children, and it's a great way to offer positive reinforcement, but particularly for kids with, um, and I think of kids with um, autism who may or may not have behavioral charts for behavioral management strategies. Um, some parents will actively like already have certain materials in their house or in their car, but it's just one more consideration to tack on is um, if you have a child or um, a youth who escalates easily and gets overstimulated or if they have sensory processing difficulties mm -hmm. and um, have really like high sensitivity to um, auditory or visual input. Um, there's a lot of different strategies and tools and usually parents are pretty aware of which ones their child will respond to. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, one more thing to tack on to yeah, the vital records list there. <laughs> what do you have in your bag? So this was the more generic Red Cross emergency kit bag that I had brought to the workshop to kind of introduce to people. Um, as a good general uh, list and cons uh, list of items to start with. And actually, I tucked in also another hand turbine, weather radio, another combination one, because these are just very, um, very useful to have on hand. Um, there's always the classic flashlight and another uh, set of duct tape here. <laughs> I, I keep duct tape in my car at all times. It has mm -hmm. helped me. <laughs> my windshield wiper blew off oh, on wow. the Mass oh, no. Pike. That's impressive. And tri <laughs> AAA wasn't allowed to come on the Mass Pike. Oh, wow. So oh, I, wow. my daughter and I duct taped the windshield wiper, and we were able to go. <laughs> Nicely <laughs> done. Nicely so done. I love duct tape. <laughs> duct tape I you have a little kit in your car already. I, I actually yeah. have a lot of stuff in my car. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's not as organized as this. And Tamara knows that she had told me all about the radio, so right. mm -hmm. I ordered them. Everybody <laughs> yeah. for, for the holidays. For the yeah. holidays. Yeah, yeah. That was yeah. Funny. But it's great because I think that's really important. I think we don't think about this until sometimes it's too late. So right. being yes. proactive is mm -hmm. crucial. And knowing yeah. your local um, channels for emergency is great too. We yes. don't listen to the radio as yes. much. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah. I don't think I would know. I think, I think that'll probably be one of the first things. <laughs> That's I'd something I have to look into as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was definitely something I had thought of. I was like, man, when they send out emergency notifications, yeah. you like no, actually knowing how to dial in. Right, right. exactly. Yeah. 
Very important. So is there more in there? There's more. There's a general comfort kit that comes with, um, it was the toothpaste and shampoo. And one note that I made to people when they're really um, thinking about packing this for their family is packing materials that their children or their family members would actually use. Mm -hmm. So if you have a kiddo who will not brush their teeth with a certain type of brush or will not use a certain type of scented shampoo, then don't bother packing it. Um, always kind of reminding families to be very mindful of what was actually feasible mm -hmm. and um, what their, um, yeah, what their children would actually use in real life circumstances. So you've got shampoo and... Yeah, there's a whole host of things mm -hmm. in here. Soap, shampoo, I think there's some lotion. Deodorant, tissues. we're going to smell a little Make towel. Sure. Yeah. But I think the most important here is to have some kind of normalcy. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I think that's what, what you're doing right. here. Mm -hmm. Right. And then obviously if you're on any medications, yes. um, you would have something with all your medications as well. And yep. you want to have an extra um, set of three days. So mm -hmm. three days of your, your normal medications three days. if you have it. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Just the same as the water and the food, you want to have the three days. Mm -hmm. They anticipate that's the amount of time that it'll take to come rescue a person in an, a disaster. Wow. That, mm -hmm. make, well, that makes sense. Yeah. What else do you have? I also have sunscreen um, and I it's have important. some... Um, emergency poncho so in case it's raining and I have an emergency blanket as well and so these are very small and compact right. yes. but they're That's very, really and very lightweight so it's very important to make sure you don't have a heavy bag if yeah. you have to leave then you right. and yes. you'll be able to carry it and these are all things that we could be able to find at a pharmacy is that I true? Think so. is it, are, they, are they easy to, to find? Um, I get everything online nowadays mm -hmm. um, so it's always nice because it's a little bit cheaper online. You can Candy. buy a few of them, mm -hmm. yeah. um, but I'm not sure about pharmacies. I would have to. Yeah, depending on the store. Um, yeah. I know that, yeah, ponchos and um, the bl like, yeah, the actual blanket itself. I wonder, yeah, that's worth exploring actually to see which ones, which retails are actually providing uh, which item there. Yeah. It'd be interesting to know, especially in the city, because I know we have many, you know, pharmacies, but a lot of times smaller <laughs> because right. Right. we're in an urban environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, whenever I go to the suburbs, I'm like, oh, everything's huge. I have <laughs> yeah. so much selection. <laughs> right. Um, but, I mean, most of this seems like you could you could get at least the, the basic things. And mm -hmm. that there's ponchos there, too. Yeah. Yes. No, I'm, I'm sure. So um, how do we begin this? And, you know, the bag is one thing, but mm -hmm. like coming up with a plan, my, my children always say, if there's a natural disaster, um, we're all driving up to New Hampshire, and we're going to meet in New Hampshire. And that's not really realistic. <laughs> um, so how, mm. how do you work out a plan with your family? You know, how do you begin that process? Yeah, um, I'd really liked FEMA's emergency plan online on FEMA.gov. Um, it actually really fleshed out the rationale for picking um, ways to communicate if you didn't have access to your cell phone, um, but also really broke down the actual steps about, mm -hmm. well, if you're going to meet outside your home or outside your community, pick, a location. pick the address mm -hmm. and have written copies on you and really convert um, that emergency plan into more of a living document. Right. Yeah. And actually practicing it. So some people might have a plan, but they don't know how, what if there's a good thing about it or a bad thing about it they need to figure out what works and what doesn't work mm -hmm. yes. so what one thing is having a plan but also testing it out yes. before an emergency is great too yeah. like testing out just that like the drills we do training. at school or at work oh we yes need to be doing that with our families right and yeah another uh, important thing about contact information is having um, FEMA does a great job about reminding you in, mm -hmm. our, in their checklist if you go online is to have uh, maybe a family or a friend outside of the state mm -hmm. that you can contact because the phone lines not, might not be working locally, but that way you can make a phone call to outside the state to let people know you're okay. That's great advice. Yeah, yeah that so. was a tip that a lot of people hadn't thought of. I had never thought it's of so that one. It's so interesting. Yeah, it makes sense when you think about it. Um, mm -hmm. I actually have some uh, handouts here. It's about. Uh, it's from uh, making a kit, and this one's specifically about being ready for uh, people with disabilities and special needs. And so it talks about um, making sure you have those basic needs met but also additional needs if you have them, whether mm -hmm. it be limited mobility, sensory needs, um, there might be special items that people may require. So, so where, where would we get that? Um, you can go online um, to ready.gov. Ready.gov. Yep, okay. and so they have a lot of great information um, for everyone. Yeah, yep. they have a lot of resources on there. They do. Yeah. That's great, so now, 
we're going to go back to your OT practice framework. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was great. If you were in a student in my class, I would have given you an A for that. <laughs> <laughs> it, really, it just was really clear. Um, how do we now take the next step of trying to make sure that academicians teaching occupational therapists mm. make them aware of this and what can we do to help build this competency? Because obviously there's not enough people mm -hmm. doing this. And we could be one workforce that, that joins in, maybe, you know, maybe full force. Mm -hmm. So what, what can we do? Oh, I have a little host of ideas, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll go for them. Yeah, a couple that came to mind immediately at the end of the workshops, people were kind of coming up going, um, you know, what can I do in my like respective workplace setting? People were coming from very different settings. Um, in school-based practice, people were kind of energized by the idea that they could have these ready-go bags. Um, everything from the kids' allergies to actual tools um, on hand, but it does raise the question of um, how to tackle this in different arenas, and it came back to, yeah, in graduate school programs, is there a way to introduce this? Um, mm -hmm. There's different um, progress being made in terms of people bringing workshops to conferences as of recently and um, publishing a bit more. There's, in the past five years, there have definitely been a few studies on um, very specific populations. Um, one was hearing impaired, one focused on people with spinal cord injuries, um, one actually focused on increasing preparedness for low-income families, which is a huge oversight mm -hmm. um, wow. for families who don't have a lot of resources, may mm -hmm. not have access to cell phones or credit cards, um, raises a lot of consideration. So it's something that, um, in terms of professional development, I know I'm interested to see if there's more um, capability or potential to develop um, online webinars and modules. I know that's happening at the level um, in public health arena in Boston, but um, there's a lot of interest out there among graduate students right now. I think so, and you may know that the World Federation of Occupational mm -hmm. Therapists, WFOT, um, took this on. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say um, that. Yeah. And yeah, do you want to go on to oh, that? You go ahead if you'd like. Um, I just know that you had recommended looking into it. Um, I think the, they're making an effort to make this kind of an idea that's been sparked and seeing, you know, who's going to catch the flame or, you know, mm -hmm. grow with it. Because I think a lot of people, and I'm still young in the field of occupational therapy, mm -hmm. um, think of occupational therapy as maybe a rehabilitation or therapy uh, versus before you get to that point. So in emergency preparedness, there's always the aftermath that you're dealing with, the rehabilitation, getting people back on their mm -hmm. feet. And I think that if you see it from a different perspective and say, how can we be proactive? Occupational therapists have all these great ideas and all of these great resources for people with these needs. How can we tackle that before the, the storm? You know. Mm -hmm. So I think if you, if you look at it a little differently, people will start to appreciate the field. That's great. Yeah. And I think you know, just from you know uh, an academic perspective, we have to get more publications, more right. research yeah. right. to show you know the contribution we're making and that it's making a difference. Right. Because that's the bottom line, I think. Yeah. Um, and so I challenge both of you. <laughs> yeah. Wow! Yeah. <laughs> On television. On television. <laughs> to, to, to do you know this may be your doctoral project. Um, it was your doctoral project, and yeah. you're reaching out, doing workshops. But I always say to people. Um, you need to publish in evidence, you know, a, a journal that has an impact factor mm -hmm. so that the word can get out much bigger um, and to identify occupational therapists as the right profession or occupational therapy assistants, the whole, mm -hmm. you know, practitioners, um, that they can be there. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential to um, utilize community resources and have people familiarize each other. Um, with the different players in action, and um, that includes everything from councils on aging all the way up to knowing who your local emergency management officer is in town. Mm -hmm. um, right. So it's an exciting area to get involved in. And before we go, Tamara, you had mentioned um, before the show that there's some resources in Brookline. I thought yeah, that might yeah. be um, a great mm -hmm. way to end the show is to share that with some of you. So you know what you have at your, what you, what you can access locally. Locally, around the corner, um, mm -hmm. actually. So at the Public Health Department, um, there's a few programs going on there. There's CERT, which is Certified Emergency Rescue Team. Um, so you can become part of this, and you have to go through a training, and you are part of the emergency rescue team, essentially. So if there is an emergency locally, these pe individuals that are trained 
um, come to the scene and help the community as, as they can. Um, then there's also kind of a less of a training option for volunteers. It's uh, the Medical Reserve Corps that you mm -hmm. had mentioned, um, and that is just a, a training or two. You can uh, participate in drills, and you can also participate um, in uh, workshops and trainings, um, and also be at the scene if you need to help the community out. And this is in Brookline. It's fabulous. Um, and yeah, they have trainings great. every so often. If So if you go to your local public health department, they have the information there. And I'm also part of this very interesting uh, program here in Brookline. It's called mm -hmm. the Brookline Emergency Preparedness Buddy Program. So you get linked up with an individual that may not have family or friends nearby um, mm -hmm. to help them and assist them be in becoming prepared for an emergency. And as part of that, it's a free program that these individuals get linked with. So you have a buddy, an emergency management buddy. You contact them during the time of an emergency and get all of their needs addressed. And they get a kit. They get this whole bag with all of these items inside of it. Wow. That's great. And yeah. you, and you said that you contacted your buddy um, over the last snow emergency, Yeah, right? I've actually contacted her. We've been buddies for a while, and even during the heat last summer, um, to make sure that she had water, um, the food that she needed, all of her prescriptions were met uh, just in case if the power went out, and also during the snowstorm as well. That's great. Yeah, that's, that's so, very and, cool. and so it's really great. It's a nice program, and it's local, and they definitely need more buddies. Um, <laughs> so if you could participate and help out, Noted. that'd be great. Yeah. And next month, last pitch, <laughs> next <laughs> month is um, Public Health Month. So um, also the health department has a few activities going on. That's so. great. That's yeah. really great. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Oh, that's Thank wonderful. you both so much for sharing all this wonder, wonderful information. I know myself, I can't wait to share this with all my friends and family because I learned a lot. And I think, like I said before, you and you guys have both mentioned, being prepared, we don't always think about it until after the fact. Mm -hmm. We all got lucky. I think none of us were too impacted by the snow, but what if it was 10 times worse? And um, knowing the resources we have at our fingertips, not only to help ourselves, but to help others mm -hmm. is very empowering. So thank you both again yeah. for sharing that with us and for join joining us tonight. Thank you all thank for you joining so us. Thank um, it's a pleasure as always. It is, it's great. And go to those resources because we need to be prepared.